Well, why don't we um, begin, and we appreciate your understanding that there may be people coming in, uh, and also that this is being broadcast across the globe, apparently, so there may be questions that come in from elsewhere that we'll address. That's why we're wearing microphones, otherwise we're, we would just sit down and have a conversation with you. But why don't we first start <coughs> with just getting a sense of some of the questions that you might have generally in terms of what is a very complex disease that has a lot of factors related probably to its cause, to its progression, perhaps to its lack of progression. And then we'll think together about how to kind of connect some of these dots in ways that, that make sense. So what kinds of questions do you have just in terms of the disease overall? Can you possibly just give us a, um, a rundown, just a simple and simple term, what, what happened with NMO? Great question. Yeah, we can do that. Others? Shall we start with that one, kind of the, the, the NMO 101 yeah. kind of a feel? Okay. Yeah, no problem. Yep. We're, Great. We're Thank you. I'm not good at that. That's where I need help. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know, this is Dr. Scott Zambel. You met him uh, having been on the, the panel earlier. Scott is one of the world's experts, not only in autoimmune immunology, but in particular in MS and NMO immunology. So he knows a lot about the molecular and cellular aspects going on. And uh, I come from a little different perspective, and so together we can kind of work through this in a way that we can all understand it. And one of the things that we hope to achieve is that you understand NMO better than you think you do already, and we'll just you know, see how that works out, okay? So Scott, let me start with a couple you of things and then you it. can take <coughs> a few things from there. So <coughs> let's just think about the players in the disease, okay? So we can start at this end. with a neuron, okay? And what we're gonna try to do is work from the bottom up. That is, if this is the downstream target, we wanna work all the way back up to the headwaters of where it all begins. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> there are special kinds of cells that we call microglia cells. And somewhere between the inside of the central nervous system and the outside of the nervous, nervous system, central nervous system is something known as the blood-brain barrier, which is an interesting concept. It's not really a you know, specific thing. It's more of a collection of things that together form a barrier. Okay, we'll come back to that. So that's called the blood-brain barrier. Now, if this is in the central nervous system, so this is what you might expect to be in the brain, in the spinal cord, or within the optic nerves, then what happens beyond that point, or what we call the periphery. Okay, what are the players out here? Well, again, working backwards. Let's use these as symbols for NMO IgG antibody. Okay, also called anti aquaporin 4. And let's use squares as symbols for a system called complement. 
complement is really a collection of 30 or so proteins made by the liver. Now antibody comes from a certain type of lymphocyte. So of all of the white blood cells, there are two major types, leukocytes and lymphocytes. We'll talk about the leukocytes in just a second. B cells make antibody. So these are B lymphocytes. And as Scott knows better than many in the world, the particular kind of antibody made in this disease is only made if another type of lymphocyte says okay. So this B lymphocyte or B cell, and we'll talk more about this, but this is the target of rituximab, for example, will only make this antibody if even before this, a different lymphocyte called a T lymphocyte gives an approval. Okay, I mean, if we were to sit around and make this up, it would be a fascinating novel, right? But it's true to the best of our understanding, and it is fascinating, it is beautiful, and it is mysterious. But I think you'll see how you know a lot of this already. Now, we'll talk more about where these cells come from. But in addition to these direct effects, both of these kinds of lymphocytes give off or, or release molecules that are called cytokines. So cytokine comes from a Greek uh, set of roots, cyto meaning cell, kine meaning to take action. So these molecules cause other cells to take action, in addition to talking to one another. One of the types of cells that takes action is the granulocytes. And there's a few different kinds of those. These are cells that are filled with granules. So you've probably heard the term neutrophil, or this morning you heard eosinophil. Those, uh, and, and there's also basophil. Those descriptions are really just how the cells stain with certain kinds of stains. And we can talk about that later. Neutrophils are basically what we think of when we talk about white blood cells that defend us against infection. And there are other types of cells too, macrophages and things, but we'll, t we'll talk about that later. So here's the basic situation. And then we're gonna have Scott tell us a little bit more about the steps that occur in these cells talking to one another that's so important in breaking the machine. And what I mean by that is the word that we need to really make sure we all understand, and that is tolerance. So tolerance is when the immune system accepts a cell or a molecule within us as being normal. It says, okay, I will tolerate you. If the immune system is educated otherwise, somewhere along the line, to see a human cell or a human molecule as being foreign, and turns the immune system to attack that, then the immune system has lost tolerance to that molecule or cell. So let's just make sure we're all on the same page here. True or false, in NMO, the immune system has tolerance to aquaporin-4. That's false. It has lost tolerance to aquaporin-4. Does that make sense? Okay. So these are the basic players. We have the targets of the central nervous system tissue, including 
neurons, microglia, but there's a major cell that I've left off of here intentionally. Anybody have a guess as to what that is? It's the cell that kind of holds all these together and feeds the neurons and it comprises most of the central nervous system tissue. It's named after a, a shape, particularly a star shape. That's the astrocyte. So let's just make it something that, you know, may have more of a star shape than that, but think of it as a, as a cell that interacts with all these other cells and with the blood-brain barrier. So consider it a little bit like glue in the central nervous system. Where does aquaporin-4 come in this? Great question. The aquaporin-4 that we're worried about in NMO is expressed in the membrane of the astrocyte. And if we were to zoom in on that picture, aquaporin-4 is a water channel. It's a protein. Four of which come together, so it's called a tetramer, to form a pore through which water can pass because our cells are made up of membranes that water cannot pass through easily normally. So we have to have pores that allow water to pass through. And aquaporins, as the name implies, aquaporin, water porins, are one of those kinds of channels. And they're expressed in the membrane of the astrocyte. Can I ask you a question? No. What is the... <laughs> I'm gonna, what, do you know what the root of the term neuromyelitis optica is? Why is it called neuromyelitis optica? Okay, so that's the optica. And the myelitis is the spinal cord. So that's where this term comes from, neuro, but then myelitis, meaning the spinal cord, and then the optic nerve. And the term CNS, central nervous system, you know, I think you understand the major components are the spinal cord and the brain, and the optic nerve is part of that as well. So that's why we use the term central nervous system. So how do we feel so far? Any questions, anything not clear? True or false, complement is one protein. A lot of different steps and proteins in the complement system. You heard about eculizumab? Have you heard about that story yet? We'll talk about where that comes into play here, but it's an example of a drug that's been developed to target one of the proteins in the complement system, and it looks like it has good efficacy in a small number of NMO patients. Okay. One last thing, depending on how the antibody, which may be formed outside of the central nervous system, or it may be formed by B cells that move into the central nervous system, that's a question that we don't know yet exactly. But depending on where it's formed, ultimately antibody moves into the central nervous system binds to the aquaporin-4 on the astrocyte and that sets off a chain reaction of bad things. And we'll talk more about that in just a second, but I just wanted to kind of stop here as the big picture. So normally they would not cross the blood-brain That's one good point. Normally the blood-brain barrier keeps a lot of big molecules out, including sometimes big proteins like uh, antibodies. But sometimes they get through for reasons we don't know, but we think breaches or openings, temporary or permanent, in the blood-brain barrier allow the antibody to get in. Autoimmunity? 
that's a great question. So let me just make up a hypothetical situation. Let's say we tested 100 people that seemed to be perfectly healthy. Do you think we would find any autoantibodies in those 100 people? You probably would. We make autoantibodies to a lot of things. So that means then why is it that some people suffer disease and some people don't? Okay, again, I'm just, just making this up as a hypothetical. But what if a person had made some autoantibodies in the periphery and then something happened like a viral infection caused the blood-brain barrier to open up temporarily and the antibodies got in and the astrocytes were injured and that caused complement to target the tissues and the complement molecules some of which feed back to white blood cells and cause them to charge in. So now you have this process called inflammation. Inflammation, and this is the last thing I'll say, Scott, and you can, you can talk about some of this stuff up here. Inflammation is a term that was really originated in about 40 BC, uh, sorry, 40 AD by a person named Celsus, who said there are four components to inflammation. Rubor, tumor, dolor, and calor. What do those things mean? Rubor, redness. Tumor, swelling. Dolor, pain. Calor, heat. So when you cut yourself, the reason it gets red and painful and swollen and warm is because of inflammation. White blood cells are swarming in to defend against microorganisms that may have entered at that same time. Does that make sense? So when you have an, a cell that's injured, we think because the antibody binds to the aquaporin 4 that cell is expressing, and then complement senses that the antibody has bound and activates so that complement adds on to the problem by hurting the cell and by releasing signals to white blood cells in the periphery that then swarm in. You can see this whole process is part of the inflammation process. NMO is a neuroinflammatory disease. And it's one that, you know, to, depending on the extent uh, of the white cells that move in to, to target this, can be very severe. And if there's a lot of inflammation around an optic nerve, that can cause temporary or prolonged or permanent disability in optic nerve function, for example. Everybody okay so far? Let's turn this around, Scott, and can you talk a little bit about mm -hmm. the communication? First, what a T cell sees, and mm -hmm. then, mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Let's uh, flip this guy around. First, I'm gonna say that you gotta understand it's, it's not simple. You already know that, and it, there are many different steps involved. And from understanding the very beginning to causing the damage, and then there are steps involved in, that we have to have and understanding to help us develop better therapies. But we may not know the precise beginning event. So actually, I liked your diagram <laughs> because it, it had everything and your handwriting is so nice. So <laughs> I can go ahead and- Let me do this. Let's keep, keep talking, but I'll, uh, let me do this for a second. Go ahead. So what we do understand from the work with, you've been exposed to s some of the scientists who've made these discoveries here and Claudia Lucinetti and Alan Verkman and Jeff Bennett. These are the people who've been up there today who've spoken. They've really described, along with Vanda Lennon initially, that the target is the astrocyte. So the antibody is targeting the astrocyte, which is a support, supporting cell in the central nervous system. There's an equivalent one 
which is in the peripheral nervous system, we don't have to worry about that. So there is another one like that, but this is the one in the central nervous system. So there seems to be a very specific target that we understand. And we know that the antibody is really a critical piece of this. So my interest in, in understanding is what are the triggers that lead to it? In the same way that you were asking questions about genetics, or we may ask about uh, the gastrointestinal tract, is there some bug? We don't understand what that trigger is, and we, we're not gonna solve that today. But just so you should feel comfortable in knowing that there are some unknowns uh, that we also will obsess about and perseverate on what they might be. What we do know, again, is that the antibody, which is made by the B cell, is a critical piece of it. And without taking the immunology too far, the B and the T cells are the ones that have receptors that have specificity. So I don't, I don't wanna confuse you too much, but when we talk about other cells of leukocytes in, in the bloodstream, the other ones that have been mentioned, the neutrophils, the monocytes, the macrophages, all these other names, they don't have a, specific, a specific target, but they're recruited and they play a role in, in speaking to the lymphocytes back and forth. What we know is that this one makes the antibody, but it's under control of this one. The T is for teacher. Actually, it's not. It's for thymus because they're derived in the thymus and that's how they were uh, discovered in, in the, I don't know, I forget what year it was, thymocytes. I just know the differentiation between T cells and B cells is 1969. I know that, but the thymus we knew was there before that. The T has to tell the B cell to mature, what you asked is not 100% correct. So if we have an infection to a bug, a bacteria, the B cell has enough machinery to say I'm gonna put out certain antibodies, but they won't be really with a high affinity. They're gonna be what we call IgM, they're the big ones, and they put together multiple ones together. Those are IgM. But the ones that are involved in neuromyelitis optica are the mature antibodies. So when we give you a vaccination to tetanus or anything, we're concerned about making the IgG. And the NMO is, the antibody is NMO IgG. And to get from the immature antibody to the mature, you require the teacher, the T cell. And that's where things get a little bit more complicated. So for every step involved, you have to add an exponent of about five. It just gets more complicated. And so we know that if the antibodies are against this target to the astrocyte, to aquaporin-4, that the T cell, there's got, there must be T cells that recognize that autoantigen and they play a role in directing the antibodies. And that's where we've been working on understanding what the T cells actually see on the aquaporin-4. And indeed, a number of labs have been able to show just this year that we can see in patients with NMO that there are also T cells. So it's understanding a step. We already knew that the antibody was the important part. We're just going further upstream to what might be the cause. So that's understanding the pathogenesis. Scott, this before gets you, com okay, before go, you go on, because I know where you're headed. Let's make sure everybody is comfortable with the, the jargon so far. So the word autogen or autoantigen, everybody understand what that is? Okay, let's make sure we, we are all in the same wavelength here. So. Let's, uh, let's ask this, is an antibody a protein or a, a, a chemical? It's a protein. So an antibody is just a big chain of amino acids put together. It's a protein. And in fact, there are four different pieces that comprise an antibody. We can talk about that later. But an antigen, 
an antigen is also typically a protein that is seen by the immune system as something to respond to. I mean, think about the word antigenic, to, to begin a response, an anti-response, antigen. So an antibody is a protein that's produced in response to an antigen. Now normally an antigen is foreign. It's a piece of a microorganism, it's a splinter, it's something that enters our body that's not normal to us. As Scott was saying, a piece of a microorganism or something. An auto antigen. What does the term auto, A-U-T-O, mean? Self. So you guys tell us then, what is an auto antigen? Well, that's one example, but let's, you know, let's, let's follow the, 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 let's build the, the definition together. So we know an antigen is a molecule or a protein that causes the immune system to react. And we know that auto means self. So then what is an auto antigen? That's one way to look at it. Does it make sense that an autoantigen is a protein made by your own body that now the immune system sees as foreign? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so you mentioned when a woman becomes pregnant because Many of the genes that are being expressed in that fetus are from the man. There's a whole bunch of non-self <coughs> proteins being made, possibly, and some of those are recognized as autoantigens. But with NMO, you tell us, what is the autoantigen? What is the protein that may have changed? As one example, as one possibility. What protein are we talking about that's the target of all of this problem? That's expressed on the astrocyte membrane, aquaporin-4. So if somehow through the course of one's you know, life, let's say the gene that encodes aquaporin-4 changes, and now that protein is different somehow, and now all this time the immune system had been tolerant to it and said, okay, that's aquaporin-4, I know you, you're safe. But now the protein is different. And now the immune system, as Scott will talk about in just a second, sees that protein as foreign and begins to attack it. In effect, the immune system begins to attack us, ourself. Autoimmunity, self-immunity, immunity to self. That makes sense? Okay, and now Scott will tell us how all that works. Let me just back up one, one yeah. second. Does, do, does everybody know someone that has childhood diabetes? Yes. You, you do. Anybody know someone who has rheumatoid arthritis? Yes. The joints. These are other autoimmune diseases. And the autoantigens for type one diabetes are in the pancreas in the joints for rheumatoid arthritis. And if we went back to the flip chart here instead of N neuromyelitis optica, we talked about MS, I would put up another cell type, and that is the one that makes the myelin, the oligodendrocyte, the one illness that people thought you might have had before they made the diagnosis of NMO. Different protein targets, and this Looks pretty complicated, this whole thing. That's the key part that you understand, that it makes the antibody. What we're trying to figure out is what is happening over here and the initial steps. And then there would be other arrows that lead to this one as well. It gets more complicated. This here is the T cell. It has a specific receptor 
what is a receptor? It's another protein, also on the cell surface, that recognizes the aquaporin-4, okay? The T cell will recognize aquaporin-4, but only when it's given by another cell type, a communication between this one called the antigen-presenting cell. And I'm going to genetics, because this helps us understand what this is. We know that patients with neuromyelitis optica, that there are certain genetic predispositions. It's not that we're saying parent to child, but if we look at this known as MHC, more terminology, sorry for the jargon, but the proteins, when we have a liver transplant, a lung transplant, or a heart transplant, we always have to get our tissue type right. And the T cell recognizes the antigen only with those molecules, and they differ between us. So I know that's complicated, but there are certain ones that seem to be associated with NMO, and a T cell recognizes an, a protein, the aquaporin-4, but only when it's presented by a cell that has this MHC. So I just went at 90 miles an hour from about 20 miles an hour. Scott, we're gonna, let's do an experiment. Okay. We're going to do an experiment, okay? Would you participate in this experiment? Yeah, yeah. Just, just stand right here. And let's just um, have a quick definition. I am an antigen-presenting cell. Scott is a T cell. What's your name? Hi, Mindy. Michael. Mindy is a B cell. Okay, we're all just cells. We're just, you know, doing what we do. So somewhere along the line, my being an antigen presenting cell, my job is to look for things in the body that might be foreign. And I'm constantly looking around. I'm looking, I'm looking. You know what? I bump into this cell that has this aquaporin-4 stuff on it. And I take that aquaporin-4 and I process it. I grind it up. I you know, and then what I do, because I'm an antigen presenting cell, is I have a molecular handshake with a T cell. I say, you know what, I've been roaming around out there, I found something, you might want to know about it. There you go. That's what's happening right here. Okay, so now the T cell says, okay, I got it. So I have it. And I am now directing you. But if I can't do it myself, then I need you to help. And I'm helping you do that. And so then when you get that, you take this. And what happens is you clone yourself. You become many. You become very active. I don't want to say happy, but I would say that you'll produce many B cells. And they'll all be the same one. And they all recognize this. And those the antibodies that come off the B cell, this, go to the astrocyte, to the central nervous system, okay. to the optic nerve, and to we'll, the spinal cord. We'll turn this back around again, but does everyone understand? It's a molecular handshake. These receptors bind to one another. So it's antigen presenting cell to T cell to B cell, and then the B cell starts making the antibody that the T cell told it to. Are we good with that? So if you're good with that, then you know you are now at the 90th percentile of understanding NMO. Sure. It's it's a different. They're both lymphocytes. So there's only two types of lymphocytes. They're either T or they're B, and they have a different background. Remember I said T is for thymus. They come from, you know, from the thymus. The B from the bone marrow. The T's actually do too, but they differ in how they, they, they're different because they recognize the antigens in a different way, and they do different things. So they're as different among themselves as another cell type might be I mean, I'd almost say a neuron to another cell type. 
they really do have different properties. Even though they're lymphocytes, they have one aspect that is critical. They have memory. They will not forget. So if you give a rituxan, which will knock out the B cells, or you knock out the T cells, if you don't get rid of every last one, they're going to come back in some way because they can build up clones and they can expand. And so they recognize their molecular signature, how they recognize the protein, and what they recognize on the aquaporin form might be different. But the, the effector, the cell that we're concerned about, or the, is the B cell or the antibody. The antibody is the culprit here. We do understand that. So let's, for the last couple of minutes, take a couple of questions from the web. It, is there one? Yeah, so we have, we have a couple. The first one is, and I'm going to um, watch the pronunciation. How close is the aquaporin drug from being released for patients? OK, great question. It's regarding aquaporumab. So what is aquaporumab? In a nutshell, aquaporumab is a synthetic antibody that's meant to block the disease-causing antibody from binding to the astrocyte. It's several years from potentially being put into the clinic because it's just been discovered, really, and, and generated. And as you know, the first thing is safety. So it's, it's a ways, if it ever gets there. It's a molecular decoy, a decoy. Is there another question from the web? Yeah, just one more. Um, lots of, uh, lots of things talk about stopping the attacks. Can you talk about dealing with the nerve damage and what is the best way to help with that? Okay, this is, a, I think, a great question, and we, I think we're nearing the end of the session, so let's try to put a few things together. Does it make sense that a molecule that targets B cells You've heard of rituximab, right? Just so you know, there are pharmaceutical companies that are very uh, interested in making even better, potentially better B cell targeting molecules. But let's just put all this together as a way to check to be sure you fully understand. If there is a molecule, a drug, that takes B cells out of the picture for a while, what happens to antibody? If antibodies are made by B cells, what, hap what do you think happens to antibody? Let's say many of them might go away. We're actually not sure about that. But if antibody goes down, the idea is there's more or less injury of astrocytes. We would think less. If that's the case, and the astrocyte is healthy, and because the astrocyte helps neurons stay functional, that gets to the issue of pain, ability, and regeneration, perhaps. That is, if we can stop all of the inflammation, then hopefully the neurons can heal. And if they can heal, then strength may come back, vision may improve, et cetera. Does that make sense? Okay, I think there are many other questions. You're welcome to stay, and we can just keep on going. But uh, we wanted to say thank you very much for, for participating. and. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again next year, but please uh, hang around if you're, if you're interested in continuing our discussion. Thank you.